Okay, um, hi everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. So um, this is Worms That Fight Back, uh, Nematodes as an Antidote for IoT Malware. Um, so worth pointing out that what I'm going to talk to you about today is presented for uh, educational purposes only. Uh, also worth pointing out that this isn't a, a brand new concept, this is building on work that's been done previously, uh, as you guys will see by the, the references and the, the kind of case studies that I'm going to talk about. So my name is Matt Wixey. Uh, I lead research for PwC UK Cybersecurity Business Unit. I uh, also work on its ethical hacking team. Uh, I'm a part-time PhD student at UCL and my previous role was uh, working in law enforcement uh, in the UK uh, leading a technical R&D team. So I want to talk about uh, nematodes or anti-worms because I think it's a really interesting and, and really underexplored concept. So it's kind of been talked about a little bit before um, and it actually goes back right back to the 1970s when uh, malware kind of first started to, uh, to be experimented with and played with. Uh, I have a kind of general interest in repurposing bad stuff uh, for good purposes. Um, and as far as I know, this kind of concept hasn't really been applied to IoT um, in any kind of uh, security research sense anyway. So I'm going to cover uh, what a nematode is, what an antiworm is. Uh, I'm going to go through a uh, history of nematodes in the wild. Uh, I'm going to cover why um, those attempts didn't really kind of take off um, and kind of previous attempts to produce nematode frameworks uh, as a kind of commercial offering or service offering. I'm then going to talk about something called neotodes, which uh, is a term I've come up with just to describe new kinds of worms using uh, new replication vectors and whether that makes it worth reopening the debate and whether anti-worms are something that could be used. Uh, I've got some demos for you as well, so I'm going to demo some nematodes that I've developed. Uh, I'm then going to talk about something called the antidote framework, which is something experimental that we're working on at PwC, and then finally I'm going to uh, wrap up. So what is a nematode? Um, so in biology, uh, a nematode is kind of a generic term for a, uh, a worm or a kind of parasite that attacks other parasites. That's kind of how it's commonly uh, understood. In security, it's an anti-worm. So it's a, um, a tool which exploits the same vulnerabilities that malicious worms exploit. It replicates uh, in the same ways that malicious worms do. Um, but it's designed to disinfect systems, patch systems, kick malicious worms off of infected hosts. Um, and there are three different kinds based on the case studies that are out there. There are uh, true nematodes. So these are designed to, um, to exploit uh, systems which have certain vulnerabilities and then automatically like, download and install a patch and kick malicious worms off of that host. Uh, there are malicious nematodes, so these are uh, nematodes which um, are in themselves malicious but are trying to kick other malicious worms off of infected hosts to kind of boost their own infection rate, um, to kind of kill off the competition if you like. And then finally there are uh, moral nematodes, and I use the word moral uh, in inverted commas. So these are uh, nematodes which in the eyes of the author or the developer perform some kind of beneficial action. Um, they don't necessarily exploit a specific vulnerability, but they do something um, that the, the author believes is, uh, is morally good. So if we walk through the, the history of nematodes, uh, the first known one, and it's kind of apocryphal, um, is Creeper versus Reaper. Uh, has anyone heard of the Creeper virus? A couple of people? So Creeper was uh, an experiment, basically. Uh, it infected uh, 10x operating systems, and it was um, arguably the first kind of self-replicating, spreading piece of malware. Uh, it didn't really do anything. It transferred itself over to different systems rather than replicating, and it just printed out a bit of text on the terminal that you can see there. Uh, I'm the Creeper. Catch me if you can. And uh, Reaper... Uh, the rumor has it anyway, is a tool that was developed to try and catch up with the, the creeper virus um, and then kind of kick it off the system. Uh, anyone heard of Animal and the pervade routine? A couple of people. So Animal um, was a, uh, a game developed by a guy called John Walker in 1975. It was like a, a kind of guessing game. So it would ask you to think of an animal and it would try and guess what it was. 
uh, and Pervade was a subroutine in Animal that was designed to spread the game. So it would copy over to shared disks and shared drives um, so that it would kind of spread as far as possible. Uh, and Hunter, uh, again apocryphal, was a tool that allegedly uh, was designed to track down copies of Animal uh, and delete them from systems. There's Brain, um, so you'll all be familiar with Brain, uh, I would imagine. So Brain, a uh, pretty old virus, infected the boot sector of floppy disks, uh, renamed it. And you can see from this screenshot that the authors uh, ensured that their name and address and telephone number were actually included in this. Um, so there's a, a kind of couple of interpretations of that. One is that it's just kind of a more innocent time in writing viruses and malware and that kind of thing. Uh, the other, arguably, is that the brain virus was developed as a kind of warning to software pirates um, and the names and addresses and telephone number in there were added so that um, if people were infected they would have some kind of recourse and they could get themselves patched. Uh, the Denzuko virus was a, uh, a nematode that deliberately targeted uh, brain infected uh, disks so it would just replace um, what was on the boot sector, it would retitle it. Then there's CO, uh, named after the chemical formula for uh, potassium hydroxide. So CO um, would encrypt your disk, um, but it would uh, beforehand ask for permission and it would ask you to supply the password. It's a kind of a very benign form of ransomware, if you like. So this is a, a good example of a kind of moral nematode. Uh, the reason it was doing this was to try and um, protect your system from being attacked and having your data stolen. On a kind of similar note, there's Cruncher uh, from 92, 93. So Cruncher uh, would compress files um, on your system, uh, ostensibly to, to save you space. Uh, who's heard of Max Vision or Max Butler? Yeah, quite a few people. So um, Max Vision, Max Butler was a uh, penetration tester and security researcher. He ran a website called whitehats.com. He also ran something called Arachnids. Uh, which was a kind of database of attack signatures. And uh, in 1998, uh, a group called ADM released a worm that exploited a vulnerability in DNS bind software. And uh, Max Vision, whilst uh, on the one hand kind of writing public blog articles about that worm, on the other hand developed a nematode that he released into the wild. So that nematode would exploit the bind vulnerability. Uh, it would then attempt to download and install a patch for it. Um, and I believe it would try and kick off the, the malicious worm if it was on the system as well. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Max left a backdoor on the systems that were patched by that nematode so that he could access them uh, whenever he wanted. Um, and his nematode caused a lot of disruption in military networks that his nematode ended up infecting. Um, if you haven't heard of him before and you're interested, uh, Kevin Polson wrote a great book on him and his story called Kingpin, um, which describes how he went from uh, kind of a white hat researcher to running a massive carding forum. Um, so it's worth a read if you can uh, get hold of a copy. Uh, Polypedo is a really interesting one. So this is a good example of a moral nematode. Um, it's pretty basic. So it was from 2001. It was written in VBS. And uh, what Polypedo did was it would scan your hard drive uh, for images and it would look at the file names of all those images and it would compare those file names using regular expressions to a hard-coded list of file names which were associated with child abuse. And if it found any of those images on your hard drive, it would send an email to various law enforcement agencies and charities and other organisations uh, attaching the images uh, and kind of reporting it. So raising all sorts of uh, really interesting legal and ethical questions about whether or not that's justified. Uh, Blaster versus Welcher, um, so talking about kind of more recent ones here, so the Blaster worm obviously um, infected, um, uh, 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 exploited a vulnerability in DCOM RPC. Uh, Welcher was released about a week later um, and it would uh, download and install a patch. It would check the registry to see if a patch had been installed. If not, it would download and install it. It would try and um, delete Blaster from infected hosts and ended up causing all sorts of problems with network bandwidth and denial of service and that kind of thing. Uh, anyone read Stealing the Network? Yeah, a couple of people. So really great book, a really great kind of collection of stories. There's a whole series of them. Um, they're kind of like 
connected short stories written by hackers about hacking. Uh, some of the, the technology they speak about a little bit dated now, but they're really good stories. Uh, and this particular one, The Worm Turns from 2003, uh, describes a situation uh, very similar to the Blaster and, and Welchia uh, case study. Um, so definitely worth a read if you can get hold of that. And then the uh, Worm Wars from 2004. So NetSky, Bagel, MyDoom, uh, all of which were at one point trying to kick each other off of infected hosts. Um, and the authors were kind of trading insults in the source code of uh, various versions of these worms as well. So good examples of, um, of malicious nematodes. And then uh, even more recently, Mirai versus Hajime. So uh, you'll all be familiar with Mirai. Uh, Hajime um, was uh, or is an IoT nematode that exploits some of the same vulnerabilities that Mirai does in terms of uh, default passwords and things like that. Um, includes this message on infected hosts to let people know um, that it's infected it. And then I think most interestingly, the one that kind of I find most interesting is this one. So this is um, Brickabot versus Mirai, Reaper, and, and various others. So in um, December last year, there was a, uh, a post on Pastebin and Ghostbin and a few other places by someone calling themselves Janitor, and they claimed to be the author of the Brickabot worm. Um, so Brickabot um, would permanently disable machines it infected by corrupting the firmware or overwriting the firmware with a bad image. Um, and Janitor claims that uh, they did that in order to prevent those devices subsequently being misused by Mirai and Reaper and participating in uh, DDoS attacks. So that again raises all sorts of really interesting legal and ethical questions about whether it's preferable for devices to be bricked or preferable to let them remain vulnerable and then have them be used in massive DDoS attacks which end up potentially taking out parts of internet infrastructure. So um, the kind of heyday of worms, I guess, was probably um, the mid-2000s. You obviously had Conficker a few years later, which is um, you know, probably the, the, the biggest one. Um, but in recent times, uh, traditional kind of network worms have decreased quite a lot. So you still get the occasional one. WannaCry is a good example. But generally, things like exploit mitigations and better antivirus and security solutions, uh, better patching management and incident response, uh, generally just better security has meant that those kind of big uh, network based traditional worms have fallen off to a great extent. So there were some previous attempts to try and formalize a kind of nematode framework and make it something that could be used by the security community and something that could be used by organizations to try and protect themselves from, uh, from worms. So the first one uh, that I'm aware of is a guy called Dr. Cyrus Pakari, um, who gave a talk at DEF CON 9 uh, back in 2001. And he was coming from the perspective of, um, of immunology and virology and applying that to computer security. So his concept was that it might be possible to create a kind of atten attenuated or, or weakened virus, release that in the wild in order to boost the immunity of antivirus systems and security solutions. So uh, an interesting concept, um, it pretty much remained a concept, it was uh, just a kind of thought experiment really. Um, then Dave Vitel uh, from ImmunitySec uh, presented a talk in 2005 um, where he proposed uh, a framework which would automatically generate nematodes based on exploits. So the idea was that you would feed in a recent exploit into his framework and it would then generate a nematode automatically, um, which you could then deploy. Uh, unfortunately, I've only been able to find the, the slides of that talk. I haven't been able to find any, um, any source code or demos. Uh, if anyone knows of where I can find any, uh, that'd be great. Um, and then around the same kind of time, HP um, started something called Active Countermeasures. Uh, which there's not a lot of detail available about it, um, but it was essentially kind of using exploits to protect systems. And then in a similar vein, uh, Fujitsu was approached, uh, maybe contracted by the Japanese government in 2012, to do a similar kind of thing. So the, um, all of those proposed 
frameworks uh, suggested a number of benefits so uh, to, to using nematodes on a corporate system. So as well as being able to kind of rapidly assess uh, an entire network for vulnerabilities and if they'd already been affected by worms to disinfect them and patch them, uh, some people also suggested that nematodes could be used for things like distributed searching, uh, for self-discovering networks, so discovering things like shadow IT or hosts which weren't kind of 100% up. Um, and even potentially vulnerability scanning, so consistent vulnerability scanning where every host is a scanner. Uh, the counter arguments for that uh, are many, really. Um, so firstly, there's legality. So just releasing a nematode into the wild in the majority of countries uh, is going to be illegal because you're still accessing and modifying someone else's system without authorization. Um, there's also an ethics question to it as well, whether it's right to do that, whether it's right for someone to kind of take on that role of uh, deciding that they're going to sort out your security for you. Uh, there's also a trust model, so evidence from the, the Max Vision case study where uh, despite developing a, a kind of beneficial nematode, he also put a backdoor in it as well. So what makes us um, able to trust nematode developers any more than, than a worm developer? Uh, obvious issues with denial of service and bandwidth as well. So, because nematodes uh, will be like worms, consistently scanning for new hosts to attack, uh, and will be replicating, uh, that can potentially cause issues uh, with that as well. Uh, hard to target and control. So, even if you are only launching a nematode on an internal network, uh, maybe a fairly small network, if that somehow gets onto a removable device uh, and that's then plugged into another machine, then that can spread that way potentially. Uh, and lastly, just that worms are difficult to do, uh, difficult to do well anyway. So it's hard to write uh, an effective and efficient worm which isn't going to crash the host that it infects, that's not going to generate uh, too much network traffic. So of those frameworks, none of them kind of really went anywhere. Um, none of them kind of really addressed that, that fear factor. Um, and combined with the demise of those traditional big network worms, it pretty much meant that the concept uh, died a death, really. Now, uh, neotodes, uh, or kind of new generations of worms, possibly um, could make it worthwhile reopening this debate. So if you look at some recent and some not so recent vulnerabilities and, and exploits, um, so taking this from the left, you have the Philips Hue light bulb. So a black hat talk a couple of years ago described creating a worm using the Philips Hue light bulb, which could spread across an entire city. Um, you've then got Broadpone um, looking at vulnerabilities in Broadcom uh, Wi-Fi chipsets. Um, going back a few years, um, malware in RFID tags and readers um, that could spread from the tag to the reader and then from the reader to every tag that, that touched the reader. Um, so the proof of concept for that one was SQL injection, fairly easy to do. Uh, Blueborn, vulnerabilities in implementations of Bluetooth. Uh, the Arduino Yun, so that was a, a paper from a couple of years ago about a wormable vulnerability in that particular uh, Arduino board. And then uh, at the bottom, various IoT devices. Now, um, these specific devices aren't necessarily vulnerable to, um, to attacks. It's just a kind of illustration of the types of devices. Um, so particularly interesting there, you've got an IP camera, um, and I'll talk about that uh, a bit later on. So um, given that there are potentially uh, a new generation of worms on the horizon that use different methods for propagation, where traditional vulnerability, vulnerability management doesn't necessarily apply, um, and applying patches can be very difficult. You might be talking about having to have physical access to the device, uh, getting firmware updates over the air, um, potentially time consuming to do that as well if you have a big network of IoT devices. Um, many exploit mitigation mechanisms might not be possible depending on what kind of system it is. You've also got um, uh, a proliferation now of IoT devices in corporate environments. So uh, there was a good talk yesterday about um, smart speakers uh, by Stephen Hill about how um, many organizations now just have sonar speakers in their office. Um, and also as well, if you work in security and you want to demonstrate to a client or you want to demonstrate to supervisors or whatever how uh, damaging worms can be, nematodes are a really good way to do that, um, potentially. Okay, so I'm going to uh, run through some demos. Um, so the first one is an example of a true nematode. Um, so this 
is a, a fairly recent exploit. Uh, it was March this year. Um, it's a command injection vulnerability in a web application called Clipbucket. Um, so I wrote a worm in Python. Um, that worm uh, exploits the vulnerability. It downloads and runs a copy of itself. Uh, it puts a web shell on the infected machine just to demonstrate um, that it can. And then it starts to scan for new targets. Uh, the nematode uh, obviously exploits the same vulnerability. Um, it searches for both the malicious worm and for the PHP backdoor, deletes both of them. Um, it takes the uh, PHP file that contains the vulnerability and renames it, and then creates um, uh, a new version of that PHP file which just warns the user that they have a vulnerability and they need to update, and then it will scan and replicate. So I have um, four virtual machines here um, that all have Clipbucket running as a web application. Uh, and you can, this is just to kind of show at the moment that there's nothing um, on the system. This is kind of a, a fresh install of that, um, that web app. Okay, I'll skip forward a little bit. Uh, okay, so this is the uh, malicious worm being run. So it's running in uh, just a small subnet, um, finds four vulnerable web applications, exploits them, reports back to a dashboard. So it just tells us that they've been infected. If you then look at the uh, individual machines, that's the malicious worm that's now been replicated and you can see there's a shell.php file on there as well. Um, so the shell.php is just a one line uh, PHP backdoor that's been put on there. So it's just demonstrating that this has happened on, um, on all four of the machines. This is the back door. That's what it looks like. Uh, it's a very simple example. And then just to demonstrate that that does work. Okay, so you can execute commands with the web shell, which is great. So all those machines have now been uh, infected. And then this is running the nematode, so this is doing exactly the same thing. It's based on the malicious worm, um, checking the same subnet, again reporting back to the dashboard, uh, and it should tell us that they've all been uh, now disinfected. And then if we have a look at the individual machines, you can see it's renamed the vulnerable file, which is file underscore uploader.php. Uh, it's put a, a back um, a .bak file, uh, renamed it to that, and this is the, the new version of file underscore uploader.php which just tells the user that they need to update and it gives them a, a vulnerability reference. Uh, the nematode also removes the, um, the shell.php, so it removes the back door, so that now can't be used. Uh, and it's done that for uh, all four machines. So in terms of practically applying that, how you would do that, um, one option could be that you, um, you have a feed, an ex a vulnerability feed, something like exploit DB, um, something like that, and you assess for new vulnerabilities whether or not they are wormable. And if they are, or you start to hear that a worm exists in the wild uh, exploiting that vulnerability, then you can launch a, a nematode uh, on your network that checks for it, that removes malicious worms if they're found, uh, and tries to perform some kind of patch. So you would do this, um, you could either do this with an official patch if one has been released, or you can do a kind of temporary workaround. Okay, um, second demo is an IoT nematode. Um, so this is an IP camera. Um, manufactured um, under various brand names. There are two vulnerabilities in it um, that which can be chained together um, to make it wormable. So the first is a pre-authentication credential disclosure. Um, so you get the username and password to access the camera. And then the second is authenticated command injection. 
So the vendors of this camera uh, have tried to address these and some other vulnerabilities. So it used to be that you could just telnet into these cameras with no username, no password, and get a root prompt. They've uh, now disabled telnet um, by default, so you, you don't have telnet access. Um, users are encouraged to change that default username and password. Uh, it also randomizes the HTTP port uh, for the, the web server of the camera, um, which is a kind of, I guess, security through obscurity uh, more than anything else. Um, but the underlying vulnerabilities are still there. So uh, the worm can retrieve credentials uh, from the web server, use those to execute commands as an authenticated user. Um, you can then just re-enable Telnet and still get a root prompt. So uh, I was feeling pretty uh, masochistic, I guess, so I tried to write this worm in Bash. Um, turns out Bash wasn't installed on the camera uh, after many hours, so it turned out to be an SH worm instead. Um, so what the worm does is it retrieves a .ini file which contains credentials, extracts them, uses those for command injection, and then replicates. So, um, so that the demo didn't take hours to, to show you, I've put the cameras on sequential IP addresses uh, with a static HTTP port. Um, to show, so what the worm will do is it will enable Telnet again uh, with a root prompt. It will also spin the camera around so there's a kind of visual indication that's been infected. Um, and then the nematode will run and it will stop the camera from spinning um, and then disable Telnet again. So at the moment you can see that you can't Telnet into any of these cameras. So I'm now running the, the malicious worm, um, which is going to infect uh, these three cameras here. So you can see it starts them spinning. Uh, you can see on the screen that we've got username and password as well and that we're replicating onto the web server. Okay, and then you can see there uh, that we can now turn it in uh, and get a root prompt on those cameras. Oops, uh, sorry. Okay, so at this point the nematode has been launched and you can see it's going to stop those cameras from spinning. Um, it's then going to uh, clear up the malicious worm and it is also going to disable Telnet access. So uh, I will now not be able to Telnet into these cameras anymore. And then the last demo uh, is the one that, that I think uh, is the most interesting. So. Um, I wanted to try and create, just for purely educational experimental purposes, uh, an improved version of that polypedo worm. So definitely not advocating that anyone do this in the wild or actually put this stuff out there. Um, but I thought there were kind of several problems with polypedo that, that could be improved on. So it wasn't efficient, it spread by mailing lists um, and it determined what was suspicious content by the file name of the image, uh, which isn't particularly uh, robust. So when you're talking about kind of comparing images, obviously cryptographic hashes are, are the most uh, common way to do that. Um, so something like MD5, for instance, there are kind of flaws associated with using that. Um, probably the, the, the biggest flaw is that if very, very slight edits are made to images, it results in a completely different cryptographic hash. So the solution uh, is something called perceptual hashing. Has anyone heard of perceptual hashing before? Yeah, a couple of people. So perceptual hashing is uh, a measure of the similarity of two images. Um, you can, there are various ways to do it. it, it reverse image searching would tend to use some kind of uh, perceptual hashing algorithm. Uh, mine's nowhere near as complicated as that, um, but it is uh, fairly robust in the demos that I'm going to show you. So um, essentially what it does is, um, and it's based on some previous work in this area, uh, is it will break an image down into eight by eight pixels, um, it will then retrieve the pixel values, calculate an average pixel value, and then for every pixel, uh, if the pixel is above the average, it will assign a 1 to a string, and if it's below, it will assign a 0. So you end up with a 64-bit string of 1s and zeros, which is a, a representation of uh, how each pixel differs from the average, whether it's higher or lower. So you can then just compare that string. So just do simple uh, string matching. Um, 
And for what is like a really primitive algorithm, uh, really, it's pretty tolerant to things like resizing, so to thumbnails of images, to um, minor edits in the images, and to like sequential frames or different frames from, uh, from the same video. So the uh, example nematode I created, what it does is it scans a folder uh, for images. Um, it will generate perceptual hashes, so those 64-bit strings of those images, and it will compare them to a hard-coded list of uh, hashes for suspicious images. And if it's above 90%, it will send an email and attach those images. Uh, replication is over USB, um, so it will check for attached removable media. And uh, it uses a technique that's been seen in the wild before for, uh, I think it was KJ Worm, NJ Rat, that kind of family. So it will replicate itself as a hidden file, uh, create a visible shortcut with a notepad icon, and then the target of that shortcut is a hidden file. So the examples that I'm going to use for this demo uh, are this one. So you have uh, an image of a plane that's just been resized, that's been cut down. You have an image where there's been a very slight modification. And then you have uh, two stills from the same video at different points. So obviously visually similar but different images. Okay, so this is the inbox that notifications are going to come into. It's empty at the moment. Um, there's a USB drive attached to this laptop that is also um, empty at the moment. So this is the, um, the folder of original images and the, the corresponding perceptual hash values. And then this is the folder uh, that the nematode is going to check uh, for suspicious images. So when the nematode is run, uh, you'll be able to see that it, it starts to find some matches, it indicates what might be a match, says that it's sending us an email, um, and at the end it replicates itself. So the plane, uh, which was the resize, was a 95% possible match, the uh, slight modification 98%, and the video still was 93%. So we go and check the inbox now. We can see that it sent us an email. It said I've infected this machine. Um, I found this image which matches this reference image. Here's the similarity score. Uh, let me know if I got it right. Uh, and it's done that for all three of those uh, results. And then uh, the nematode is also replicated over to the USB drive. Uh, so if we have a look at that. So there's now a shortcut file in there which just says my notes and the target for that is a hidden exe uh, which is the nematode which is also on there. Um, so if we uh, refresh the, uh, the, f the file listing uh, for the drive you can then see the, the hidden executable. So there are some refinements that, that could uh, in theory be made to that to kind of make it a bit more robust so you could have like a depth count of infections so that you only infect so many um, machines after your initial infection. You could also uh, have alternative replication methods as well. Okay, so the last thing I wanted to talk to you about was antidote. Um, so antidote uh, is something that we're working on at PwC. We're in the very, very early stages of doing it. The goal uh, the, the kind of um, the idea is to create a modular, free, open source framework for people to uh, develop and use IoT nematodes, nematodes in general, but with a focus on IoT uh, on their own networks. So um, the the dream is to have this as a kind of nematode version of Metasploit. Um, so you can um, overcome a lot of those uh, early. Um, criticisms of nematodes and nematode frameworks by um, customizing the exact payloads that are used, uh, deciding whether or not you want it to replicate and how much, uh, whether you want a delay between scans and exploitation, whether you want hosts to reboot once they've been um, uh, fixed and scanned, and whether you want patches to be applied. Um, so it is very much in the early stages. Um, I'll just show you kind of a, a video so you've got an idea uh, of what it might look like. So this is a kind of proof of concept. Um, 
but it would be great to get your thoughts on this and your feedback and if you want to get involved in uh, the development or you've got any thoughts uh, it'd be great to hear from you uh, I'll put my contact details up at the, the end of the talk um, so uh, this is kind of a just a demo version that just shows um, the kind of features that it, it might have so it's kind of a, a console based framework you can load in various modules according to whether they're web apps or whether they're IP cameras or uh, whatever it is and obviously there would be more kind of IoT devices in those categories. Uh, you can then load a module in. Uh, you can see some info about it so whether or not it supports things like disinfection, uh, patching, replication, um, what data was released, obviously what version of software it affects and targets. Um, and then in order to do some kind of damage control so it doesn't um, leak out into the wild, you can set a starting IP address, uh, an end IP address, uh, how many IP addresses each worm should scan, uh, whether or not you want to use disinfection, patching, replication. Uh, you can have a time delay in between exploitation attack attempts um, so that you, know, you can kind of avoid bandwidth and denial of service problems. Uh, you can have a kill switch as well. Um, and you can finally have the nematode, uh, if you want, delete itself after it's um, done its job. And then it would support um, log files as well, so writing logs of what it's done. So if you do want to get involved in that, um, let me know. Um, just to say again, we are at the very early stages, but it'd be great to have this as a kind of community project. We want as many people to get involved um, as we can. Uh, my Twitter handle's there. Um, so to sum up, um, Nematodes were a novel idea. I think they still are a really novel idea. Um, ultimately not successful when they were kind of first discussed and first deployed. And because of that demise of the big traditional network worms, they weren't really um, uh, applicable. But I think with the onset of um, worms that use different methods to propagate, replicate and exploit, there's potentially uh, an argument to say that neotodes could be uh, useful in the future. Um, there are obviously still concerns that would affect it, um, but I think um, that it's, it's potentially an area of promise. Um, antidote is our very kind of experimental approach to doing that, uh, and if nothing else, hopefully it will stimulate some debate and get people talking. Um, so uh, there's lots of references here if you want some, uh, some reading uh, about the, the case studies that I talked about, uh, various other bits and pieces. Um, Twitter handles there again, email address if you want to email me. Um, but yeah, that's it. Thank you very much.